Nice. In 1984, Hasbro started getting a little more creative with new characters for their, at the time, surprise revival hit, G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero. While the good guys got themselves more specialized soldiers like a flamethrower, canine handler, and halo jumper, the bad guys didn't slack off themselves either. Joining the ranks of Cobra were an anti-armor missile specialist, a saboteur, and even a ninja for good measure. But arguably, one of the most original and interesting new enemy added was the master of disguise, Zartan. It was pretty obvious that from the start, Hasbro had pegged Zartan to be the star of the 1984 line of Joes. In that year's catalog, Zartan received top billing with his card art featured right up there with new G.I. Joe Golden Boy, First Sergeant Duke. He also had a very detailed entry in the catalog with multiple close-up shots of his figure and his special vehicle that he came exclusively packed with, which was a solo swamp skier. And speaking of his action figure, aside from his rather dark, post-apocalyptic inspired uniform, complete with mysterious face paint and a hood, he came with a mask that could be placed over his actual face to satisfy his Master of Disguise gimmick. Although I'm not quite sure why the ability to switch your face to the same bearded man every time would warrant the title of Master. But more importantly, the main draw of his toy was that it was made from a UV reactive plastic, which would basically cause the figure to turn from its usual Caucasian tone to a darker purplish blue when exposed to direct sunlight. Throw in some thermal sensitive stickers that were applied to Zartan's removable chest and thigh armor, and you've got one hell of a cool toy that literally looked different in daytime and night. This skin changing feature was highlighted in the cartoon where his character had the ability to literally change his skin color and blend in with his background, like a human chameleon. Speaking of which, during early development stages, he was actually referred to as Captain Chameleon. No, really. Thankfully, the godfather of modern G.I. Joe, writer Larry Hama, eventually gave him the name Zartan, which was an anagram for Tarzan and the chameleon name was given to his swamp skier instead. Anyway, it is also established in the cartoon that he was extremely adverse to direct sunlight, which explained why his toy skin darkened outdoors. As part of the game plan of let's make Zartan a star, he along with his biker gang posse the Dreadnoughts that would make their toy debut a year later were heavily featured in the second G.I. Joe miniseries The Revenge of Cobra. They were introduced as a bunch of mercenaries hired by Cobra and who eventually broke off with their own agenda causing additional chaos for both sides. After which they went on to form one of the greatest heavy metal bands in existence, Cold Slither, and set off to corrupt the youth of America and a few Joes with their hypnotic hit song called, well, Cold Slither. Anyway, subliminal message laced hit song aside, all this added exposure did wonders for Zartan and by extension the Dreadnoughts, making them instant fan favorites. So much so that in 1986, Hasbro went on to capitalize on their popularity by adding more members to the Dreadnoughts, who just happened to be Zartan's siblings. When I first heard that Hasbro was planning to give Zartan siblings, the image of more dark hooded mysterious post-apocalyptic looking action figures came to mind. To my surprise, Zartan's new siblings, Xandar and Zerana, came out looking quite the opposite. Both Xandar and Zerana had striking orange, or pink in some instances, hair, with bright colored uniforms. Both sibling toys were also made from the same UV reactive plastic, which, aside from their similar sounding names that started with Z, seemed to be the only things that linked them to Zartan. And while visually they looked nothing like Zartan, as a pair, they definitely complemented each other and gave off that whole sibling vibe. That being said, Xandar and Zerana's individual talents actually differed. They sort of took both Zartan's specialties, that of being a master of camouflage, and the other, a master of disguise, and expanded on them. Xandar was the ultimate master of camouflage. He was an expert of literally disappearing into the background, a living wallflower. Unfortunately, G.I. Joe writers seem to have taken this to heart, and Xandar was hardly featured in any episodes of the cartoon or issues of the comics. He's pretty much the forgotten brother, and honestly, that's all there really is to Xandar. One thing worth noting though was that he was included in the 2013 live-action G.I. Joe Retaliation movie where he had an itty-bitty ditty role as Zartan's head of security as the latter posed as the President of the United States. Of course, you wouldn't know that it was him unless you happen to read the end credits where the said character was identified as Xandar. 
As expected, Zartan, of course, was one of the main featured characters in the live-action movie, where he basically straight up kills the G.I. Joe cover girl and was played by both mummy actor Arnold Vuslu and the High Sparrow himself, Jonathan Price, when he was disguised as the president. Zorana, on the other hand, took over the role of Master of Disguise, where she used her ability to frequently infiltrate G.I. Joe headquarters. In one particularly memorable cartoon episode, she goes undercover to steal some top-secret submarine plans from the Joes and gets assigned to work with her computer specialist, Mainframe. They end up developing feelings for each other, and while she ultimately does go through with her assignment, double-crosses him, and steals the plans, she returns to save Mainframe, who is left lying unconscious under a bomb set up by Zartan. In the end of the episode, she reluctantly reveals her true identity to Mainframe, and he ends up hiding her from his teammates who are in pursuit. The episode ends with them going their separate ways, but with both of them wistfully looking up at the same moon. Aww. And just to keep Main Rana Shipper's hopes alive, their relationship is actually revisited in a later episode. In another 80s worthy plot, Mainframe and a bunch of his fellow Joes are de aged and turn into kids. Zorana finds him and secretly aids Mainframe by providing him with the means to return to his real age. I guess she wasn't interested in dating a kid. I mean, yes, she was the enemy, but even she thankfully had her limits. Aside from romancing with the enemy though, there is one more thing Zorana is known for by most hardcore G.I. Joe fans. In 1986-87, Hasbro produced animated movies for both Transformers and G.I. Joe, and for some reason, Hasbro wanted both movies to be rated PG-13. And back then, there were two quick ways to do so, either include profanity or nudity. For the Transformers, they chose profanity. So in one scene, when being attacked by the planet devouring Unicron, they had Transformers human companion Spike say, SHIT. To be fair, there is a whole lot worse stuff I would say when faced with being eaten by Unicron. Anyway, for G.I. Joe, they decided to go with nudity. So early in the movie, Zorana, as usually, successfully infiltrates Joe headquarters as an unauthorized civilian companion to the new G.I. Joe recruit, Falcon, and then goes off to the forest and undresses to take a dip at the lake. Really. Fortunately, Hasbro decided to scrap the whole nudity thing, and while the scene remained, she ended up sporting a flowery one-piece bathing suit. But, even if the idea was scrapped, the actual animation model sheet of Topless Zorana does exist. So, there you go. One thing worth mentioning was that the original vintage Xandar and Zorana toys were two of my favorites as a kid. But not for the reasons you would probably think. Towards the end of my childhood collecting days, I was constantly coming up with more innovative ways to play with my G.I. Joe figures. I had a phase where I would have my Joes do stunts. Most notable of all was making them zip line down from the second floor of our house, down across our pool below on a nylon string that I had strung from the window to the fence below. So basically, from the second floor, I would send my Joes zipping down the line with nothing but their two hands hooked onto the string. Of course, this wasn't the best way of securing the figures on the line, so it was pretty much 50-50 that a Joe would actually make it across to the end. More often than not though, he would fall into the pool, which was the best case scenario, or onto the hard concrete ground before the pool, which would often result in a cracked or broken toy. Xandar and Zorana were special since their toys had large knee pads, and when positioned properly by bending the knee to create a hook with the knee pads and hanging them upside down, gave them a close to 100% success rate of making it to the other side. So while I lost a good number of Joes with this stunt, Xandar and Zorana remained unscathed. Anyway, sorry, I went off into a major tangent there, didn't I? Enough of his siblings, it's time to get back to Z main character of the Z story, Zartan. But first, I'm hoping I can cold slither my way into getting you to like this video and subscribe to my channel. It will help me out immensely and be very much appreciated. But if you already have, thank you and please spread the word. So, back to the guy who started this all, Zartan. Ever since his first appearance in the 24th issue of the original Marvel Comics run, the Master of Disguise has figured in a number of my favorite storylines. One of which was when he took down the G.I. Joe Ripcord, who went on an unauthorized mission to infiltrate Cobra Island in search of his then-girlfriend, Candy Apple. Unfortunately, Zartan intercepts his arrival, and despite Ripcord's best efforts, Zartan gets the better of him. He then proceeds to switch places with the downed Joe, and in turn, goes off to infiltrate the Joe's super-secret headquarters, the Pit, as the injured Ripcord. In the end, it takes the brilliant deducing skills of Sergeant Slaughter to finally take Zartan down. 
Ultimately, though, he does manage to escape with the help of the Dreadnoughts and leads Cobra to assaulting and destroying the pit. Anyway, towards the latter years of the 80s G.I. Joe toy line, with Ninja, Snake Eyes, and Storm Shadow established as the bona fide stars of the property, Hasbro decided to double down on the whole ninja craze and add a lot more ninja characters to the line as well as turn other popular characters into ninjas themselves, including Zartan. As part of the whole Ninja Force subline, a radically redesigned Zartan toy was produced. Amusingly enough though, this new Zartan looked more like a biker than an actual ninja, complete with a black leather vest and bright orange mohawk. This version actually made his relation to Xandar and Zarana more believable. Despite looking really out there, the new design got one thing right. Aside from giving him a lot of bladed weapons, he came equipped with a bow, which in the comics he would use with deadly accuracy. For many fans, including myself, Zartan's ultimate claim to fame and action that firmly cemented him as one of the most badass Cobras ever was when he single-handedly ended the Cobra Civil War between Cobra Commander and Serpentor. Using his ever-trusty bow, he ended Serpentor's reign with a single long-distance shot across a raging battlefield, firmly landing an arrow right between the Cobra Emperor's eyes. Now that's hardcore stuff. But his deadly skill with the bow actually goes a lot further back than that. What made Zartan really special is how Larry Hama tied him up and made him a crucial element to the backstory of one of the line's most iconic characters, the aforementioned ninja, Storm Shadow. Now as I mentioned earlier, Storm Shadow was introduced the same year Zartan came out and as his popularity grew, his origin story was explored when he was wrongfully accused for the death of his uncle and sensei, the Hardmaster, who was shot through the heart by a mysterious arrow. On a tip that the assassin had a connection to Cobra, Storm Shadow joined the organization to flush him out, and it is later revealed that it was Zartan who was the said assassin. The irony here is that Zartan actually wasn't targeting Storm Shadow's uncle. He was actually hired by a used car salesman who would later become Cobra Commander to kill Storm Shadow's fellow student Snake Eyes, whom he blamed for the death of his older brother, Dan. Who, in another stroke of irony, actually killed Snake Eyes family while driving drunk. Oh, the twisted and convoluted tale that Hama wove. And here people give the Rise of Cobra movie shit for making Duke and Baroness former lovers and Cobra Commander, her brother, and Duke's former best friend. Ugh. Just give me back main Rana. Anyway, did you know that Zartan actually wasn't even Cobra Commander's first choice of assassin to take out Snake Eyes? If you want to know more about the man who was originally hired, check out his story here. Or if you want other G.I. Joe stories, you can go check them out here. Either way, thanks for watching and hope you come back for more.